I reckon that simulations are one of the most interesting and important parts of robotic development. Having a good simulation environment can be a really valuable tool because it's often expensive or time consuming or even dangerous to be testing algorithms on real hardware, especially when you're testing it for the first time. And so because of this, time spent investing in a good simulation environment is often well worth it. Even better than this is when someone has already made one and they give it to you for free. And that's what we have with Gazebo. It's a free robotic simulation environment that's created by Open Robotics. That's the same group that's looking after Ross. Even though they're made by the same people, the projects are managed separately. And so Gazebo isn't quite a part of Ross. This distinction can be a bit confusing sometimes, um, but Gazebo and Ross integrate very well together, even if they sometimes handle things a little bit differently. With Gazebo, we can create a virtual world and load simulated versions of our robots into it. Simulated sensors can detect the environment and publish the data to the same ROS topics that real sensors would, allowing easy testing of algorithms. Then forces can be applied to the simulated actuators on the robot, and they can take into account physics and things like friction. Gazebo has recently been rewritten and replaced with a new simulator called Ignition Gazebo, sometimes just referred to as Ignition. This is kind of like the transition that's been made from ROS1 to ROS2, except that ROS2 is still compatible with Gazebo Classic. Unfortunately, there are a couple of key plugins that aren't quite compatible with the new version at the moment, so we'll be sticking with Gazebo Classic for these tutorials, but hopefully in future we'll be able to upgrade to the new one. So today we're going to learn how to use Gazebo, how to simulate a virtual robot, and how to integrate it with ROS. So let's get started. We'll start by installing Gazebo and seeing what it can do without the ROS integrations. Since we've already got ROS installed, the easiest way to get Gazebo installed with all its dependencies is to go sudo apt install ROS foxy gazebo ROS packages. Okay, and once that's installed, running Gazebo without ROS is actually pretty easy. We just type Gazebo and then the path to a world file if we want to start with a world file. So we're going to use one of the ones that's built in called Seesaw. So it's in user share gazebo 11 worlds seesaw world. And so that'll start up gazebo. And there we see a little seesaw. Now take a minute to just get used to the environment. So left click to pan, middle click to orbit, right click or scroll to zoom around. So you can go around, take a look. And what we've got here is the gazebo world. So if we look up here, we can see all the things that are in the world. And in particular, we've got some models in the world. So if we open up that models drop down, we can see we've got five models here. There's the ground plane, which is the big gray plane. We've got cube one over here, cube two on this end, the fulcrum, which is there, and then the plank that is balancing on top of the fulcrum. And so we've got these five models inside the world. And what we can do, this is just a physics simulator, so we can grab these, we can start moving it around, and then the seesaw is unbalanced and it tips over. So we can go to Reset World, you can use Control R, and so what we can do, we can do all sorts of stuff to, you know, make the world do various things. We can actually pause time for a moment, and then uh, we can, you know, whoop, lift something up, rotate something, set things up how we want, and then hit go, and then see what happens. Um, we can apply forces to these objects. So uh, let's apply a force of minus two million newtons to this one. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to guess what's gonna happen when we do that. So it launches that one up into the air. And so at this point, this is just a, a physics simulator. What we want to do now is see how we can use ROS to get our robots into this simulation environment. So the first thing we want to understand is the gazebo model structure. Now in the last tutorial, we created a URDF for a robot and gazebo uses a similar format called SDF. Uh, it's, it's very similar to URDF, but it's just a little bit different. The good news is that we don't have to write two different files because Gazebo comes with a tool that can convert URDF to SDF automatically. Unlike URDF, which just describes a robot, SDF is used to describe the world that is being simulated as well as the models inside that world. So for example, with that seesaw that we just looked at, the seesaw.world file was an SDF file, but then each of those little cubes inside there, each of those models, if they wanted to, could have been their own SDF file. 
And this is a really flexible approach because it means we can reuse models inside different worlds or we can reuse worlds over and over again and test different robots inside those worlds. Something else to understand is that every time Gazebo wants to interact with something outside of itself, something like ROS, it needs to use what's called a plugin. And this is an extra little piece of code that does one particular thing that we can tell Gazebo to execute at a certain time. Uh, so for example, if we needed to um, control the robot externally or uh, get information out of a simulated sensor, we would use plugins to do that. Now you might remember from the last few tutorials that we have a robot state publisher which takes in the URDF description in an Xacro file, uh, it takes some joint state messages, and it broadcasts the resulting transforms, as well as publishing the description to a topic. Now, until this point, we have been sending fake messages to the joint states to move the transforms, but now we can move closer to a properly integrated system. So now we've got Gazebo, and Gazebo represents kind of the real world. Um, Gazebo has a spawn script that can read the description from the topic that's being published and simulate the robot. It will then use a plugin to see how the joints are moving in the simulation and publish those to the joint state topic. And then another plugin can take input from the rest of ROS and force the joints to move in certain ways. On top of that, any sensor plugins that we have can publish to other topics. Let's take a look at all of this in action and hopefully it'll start to make a bit more sense. So here's where we finished up in the last tutorial. We had our robot state publisher, then we had Arviz running and it was uh, looking at that. And then we had joint state publisher GUI that was running and we were faking our joint states so we could make our robot move around in the visualization. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get rid of that and upgrade our UIDF so that we can put it in a simulated virtual environment. We'll be able to uh, control the joints and the coolest bit is that we'll be able to simulate a virtual camera and be able to see what the world looks like from the robot's point of view. So we'll start by firing up Gazebo. Now this time, instead of just running it normally, because we've got to run it with the ROS integrations, we're going to use a, a launch script that has been provided for us. So we're going to run ROS2 launch Gazebo ROS gazebo launch.py. So this is going to run gazebo and it's just going to launch it there with an empty world. Then what we want to do is we want to spawn our robot. And so the gazebo ROS package also comes with a script that can take our URDF file, convert it to SDF and spawn it into the gazebo world. So we'll type ROS2 run gazebo ROS spawn entity. Now we want the topic that it's going to read from to be robot description and the, uh, the name of the entity, so the name of the robot is going to be, we'll just call it my bot. And so what this should do is spawn our robot within the world. Now immediately we can kind of see that something's not quite right. Uh, we've got, um, it's all white. If we head back into Arviz and reset, we'll see that all of a sudden our transforms aren't there properly um, because nothing's publishing the joint states anymore. Um, also, something else that's worth noting is if we have a look down here in the models, we can see our bot, my bot, but it's only got three links. And you might remember that our robot originally had five links. And that's because any links that were joined by a fixed joint, Gazebo is just going to take and collapse into a single link. Um, and so that means that they're all treated by one link, treated as one link by Gazebo. Um, and at least one of those has to have inertial properties set, otherwise it won't put work properly. So in this case, our world and our base got collapsed into one, um, and our arm and the camera got collapsed into one. So, uh, yeah, so we've got this here. It's there, but it's not quite right. We're going to look at what we need to do to, to make this work. So um, we're going to close this down. Before we do that, we're actually going to swap our launch script because um, you'll notice to do that, we had to run Robot State Publisher, and then run gazebo, and then run the spawner. Um, also, we'll need to control C to kill gazebo sometimes. It can be a bit stubborn. So uh, here where we had our, our robot state publisher launch file from, from last time, um, I've got a new one that is robot state publisher sim.launch. Um, and it starts off the same. Uh, it has this use sim time parameter added to robot state publisher. And then it also includes the um, gazebo ROS launch file and the spawn entity. So it's going to do all three of these things for us. 
So we'll start with that. Um, now, let's upgrade our URDF. So here's, here's the one that we had last time. Uh, and here I've got a little template of the things that we're going to put in it. So to start with, we're going to add an include. So we're going to include um, a new one called example gazebo.exacro. And we're going to start by just making that an, an empty UIDF. Now the way this works is that any code that is specific to Gazebo, we put inside Gazebo tags. And that way when Gazebo is reading the UIDF, it knows to look in there and it can find things that it needs, but other things can just ignore it. Um, and there are a couple of different types of Gazebo tags. You can have Gazebo tags that are attached, they're, they're connected to a link or a joint, um, or you can have Gazebo tags that are just kind of generally telling you something about the whole file. And so to start off with, we're going to fix up the, the colors because we saw that the colors were all white before. So we're going to grab these and put them in our uh, UIDF file. This is in this gazebo one. Um, so these ones are gazebo tags that are referenced to a link. So the base link, the slider link, and the arm link. Um, and then the materials use gazebo materials. So the colors that we had set before that were working before in Arvis, um, they won't work in gazebo for technical reasons. So we'll start by doing this. Um, so uh, we've got that file included in this one. We've got our new launch file. So let's now, instead of running that, we'll run our new launch file. And hopefully what will happen is we've now got colors. Isn't that great? Now, if we take a look at our viz, we'll see that these are still not working. We're still not publishing our joint states. So that's the next problem we've got to solve. So um, we'll take a look at this template again and grab this bit. So we've got another gazebo tag here. And this one is not for a particular link or a particular joint. This is just in general saying that in general, we want to be publishing joint states. And we're going to use a plugin here called the gazebo ROS joint state publisher. Um, and it's just got a couple of parameters. We set the update rate to 20 hertz and then the names of which joints we want to publish. So in this case, it's the slider joint and the arm joint. Now it's worth pausing here for a second and saying that um, there are a few different plugins that can solve this. The best way to do this is using the ROS2, Gazebo ROS2 control plugin, which is part of the bigger ROS2 control system. Uh, and that helps handle the, the publishing side of the joint states as well as controlling the joints themselves. Um, it's a great system, but it's just a little bit too complicated to set up for this quick demo. Um, so we're going to go for this simpler approach instead, but it is the better way. So we're just going to use this joint state publisher plugin. Um, so we'll close gazebo, kill our um, launch file, and we'll run it again with this new bit added in. Looks the same in here, but when we swap back to Arviz, we can see that all our states are being published now. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll put that on one side and that on the other side. Let's just hide these to get a bit more room. And now what we'll see is if we start playing with the physics simulation, this will start responding. So uh, it's looking at what's going on in the physics, and then it's figuring out what the joint states need to be, publishing them to the topic, which uh, Robo State Publisher is then sending to Arviz and broadcasting transforms and that sort of thing. Now, one thing you might notice is that the base keeps, oops, the base keeps jumping back to the origin, and that's because we set our first link as a world link. So uh, what Gazebo does is if it sees that there, then it's gonna say, I don't care what the physics is saying, I know that this has to be fixed to the origin. And so anytime you've got a robot that's got a fixed kind of base like this, then you probably want to have a world link in there so that Gazebo keeps it at the origin. If you've got a robot that's moving around, then don't have that one in there. So that's all great, but now we'd like to be able to control this. Um, now, the approach we're going to take here is a little bit messy. Like I said, the better way to do it is using the ROS2 control system. Um, but we're going to take this next plugin, which is the joint pose trajectory plugin. So we'll add it here. And so um, the only parameter we've got here is the update rate, which 
that sets it to, let's make that 20 as well. Um, what I'm also gonna do here is I'm gonna add some damping to our joints because you might have noticed as we were doing this, the joints kind of flop around a fair bit. Um, and when we go to use this plugin, uh, it's just gonna make it look a bit funny. So we're gonna go back into our original UIDF file and look at our, our moving joints. So we've got the arm joint and we're just gonna add these uh, some friction to those joints, to the arm joint and the slider joint, and that'll stop them bouncing around quite so much. So now that we've got that new bit in there, we'll close gazebo, run it again. And now what we'll be able to do is we've got this little message here. So it's gonna publish a joint trajectory message. Um, it's a bit complicated, but basically all it's doing is it's gonna say, put the slider at 0.8 meters and put the arm at 0.6 radians. So if we do that, give that a sector run and it's placed it at that trajectory. And you'll see if we zoom right in, you might be able to tell that this is actually still falling due to gravity. So even though we put those frictions in the, that friction in the joints, um, the physics is still gonna, gonna overcome that. But if we hadn't put the friction in, then this would be bouncing around all over the place. So we've now got our system, oh, we just gotta hit reset because we restarted Gazebo. So we've got our system kind of integrated now. We're able to use ROS to move the simulator and then it gets the physics applied and then those results are being fed back into RViz um, using the publisher. The next thing that we're gonna do is simulate a sensor. And this is the bit that I think is the most interesting. Um, we're gonna simulate this camera. And so we'll be able to see what the world looks like from the camera's point of view. But at the moment, that's actually gonna look pretty boring because it's just gonna be this big gray plane. So we're gonna use Gazebo to create a more interesting world to look at with our camera. So what we can do is we can go over here to the insert tab and you can see it's connecting to these model databases to get some models. This can take a really long time, so uh, I'm not quite sure why it takes so long and it has to do it again every time, but we'll just wait a minute until they connect. Okay, so those have connected now. Um, we can open up this one and we see all these models in here. So why don't we grab a construction barrel? I like to use them. And you can see it downloads the model off the internet. I've got pretty patchy Wi-Fi where I am right now, so it might take a minute. And let's grab a construction cone as well. And then if we keep clicking these, it'll keep downloading them. So what we can do now is if we go up the top, because we've downloaded them once, they should show up in that list and they're not. I'm not quite sure why they're not showing up there, um, but we'll just leave it as that for now. Um, what we can also do is we can use the model editor and the building editor. Now, these will both create model files. The model editor is used for taking uh, models that already exist or like cubes and spheres and stuff and building them together into new models. The building editor is for creating a building with walls and it's a little bit fiddly, but let's grab it and we'll try and make a, a bit of a wall. I think it's a bit of a funny system. And then we can uh, put some colors or textures on our walls. We can put a door in there or a window. And then what we can do is we can save that. So you have to save it for it to work. So let's call this my building. And then we exit the building editor and we'll see now that's become part of our world. Now, what we don't wanna to have to do is to redo this every single time that we, we wanna rerun Gazebo. So what we'll do now is we'll actually delete our robot from the world. Then we can save the world. Uh, let's just save it here and call it my world dot world. And then let's quit Gazebo. That was the wrong one, that was obvious. And then what we can do when we relaunch it, 
we can go, we can add this argument to specify the world we want to launch. So we'll specify, uh, what do we call it? Home slash my world dot world. And so it reruns. You can see those models are now in that list. Um, they just didn't load, reload before. And so we can now uh, keep adding them nice and quickly without having to wait for them to download. So now that we've got a nice little world to look at, let's add our camera. So what we're going to do, um, when we're using cameras in ROS, uh, we have to put this extra link in called the, the optical joint. This isn't a tutorial on cameras, so we're not going to go into detail on that right now. For now, we just copy and paste that and put it, whoop. we'll add that extra joint and link in there. And then we're going to get, grab this tag, which is what we need to simulate our camera. Now this looks pretty complicated to start with, but I'm just going to close these up. So what we can see is we've got a, another gazebo reference tag. So we're saying, okay, this sensor is attached to a particular link, in this case, the camera link. The sensor type, uh, we're actually going to change this to a regular camera. You'll see why in a second, rather than a depth camera. Um, it's got some parameters that are common to all sensors. Then any parameters that are specific to cameras. Um, and then the plugin that we're using to connect it to ROS, in this case, gazebo ROS camera and any parameters that are specific to that plugin. So we're not worrying too much about what these parameters are at the moment. This is just for the demo. Um, but yeah, so we've got this, we've changed it to camera. So let's close that and rerun. Then we'll also rerun Arviz. And what we'll see now in Gazebo is we get this nice little preview of what the camera is seeing. So it's seeing this brick wall. Um, and then if we add an image display here, we can set the topic to, uh, if we scroll down here, we can say my camera slash image raw. And there it is. So that's being simulated in Gazebo and then the image is being passed to Ross and we can display it in Arviz. So that's being published to that topic. Um, but what's even cooler than a regular camera is a depth camera. So we're going to close Gazebo again. We're going to change that back to depth. And then we're going to rerun Gazebo. Now, the reason that I had you change it back before is because for some reason when you're using depth camera, you don't get the nice little preview. Um, I'm not sure if that's a bug or what. It's a bit of a shame. Um, but if we reset Arviz now, We've still got our image here, but we can also add a point cloud. And so we set that to the my camera points topic that now exists. And what we should see is the 3D point cloud of what that depth camera is seeing. Whoop. And so what we can do now is go into gazebo. Let's say we shift that cone over then it'll jump there in the simulation. If we have it bounce around, you can see the depth camera is seeing it roll about. Uh, we can even uh, move our actual, Ooh. Arviz didn't like that. Not sure what happened there. I just reran everything. So uh, yeah, we should be able to move our robot around and see it respond in Arviz and you know, whatever it's looking at is now going to look a little bit different. So we can see that appears there. Now, before we finish up, there are a couple of other important things that are worth noting when we're using Gazebo. Um, the first is you might remember that back when we were looking at our launch file, we set this use sim time parameter for robot state publisher. And what that means is that um, normally when ROS is running, um, it uses the Unix system for keeping time. So it's counting the number of seconds since the 1st of January 1970. Um, but when we're running a simulation, we often want Gazebo to be able to control time. Um, you can see right now there's this real time factor 0.93. So sometimes we want Gazebo to run faster or slower depending on how we're doing the physics simulations. And so we need all of the systems, uh, all the nodes that are running in the system to understand that Gazebo is in charge of keeping time. 
And so when Gazebo is running, it'll actually be publishing to a topic called clock. And so, whoop. and so you can see Gazebo is constantly publishing to this topic. And so all of the other nodes are able to look at that and keep time. Um, so we need to make sure that use sim time parameter is set on all our nodes. In ROS1, there was a way you could just set it across the board for every node. Um, in ROS2, you have to set it for each node individually, but that's where launch files come in handy because we can make it a parameter to the launch file and then we can toggle it on and off there when we run our launch file and have it pass it down to all the nodes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Gazebo um, isn't actually just one program, it's two programs. There's a server and a client. Um, and for more advanced users, there are really good reasons that you'd want to do that, but it's sometimes confusing for someone using it for the first time. So if we take a look at the processes that are currently running on this computer, we'll see here, we've got the terminal, bash, ROS2, we can see this was our launch script that's got the robot state publisher, the gazebo server, and the gazebo client. And sometimes one or both of these might crash um, and it's not very clear what's going on and gazebo won't start again and that sort of thing. So if you get stuck in that situation, you can kill all gz server gz client. Uh, if it's really bad, you might need to use dash nine or even sudo and that will just say kill all of gazebo and then you can, you know, start it up again and hopefully it works next time. Now that we know how to simulate our robot in Gazebo, we're ready to start building one in real life. And so that's the end of this tutorial series, at least for now. But pretty soon we'll be kicking off a new series on how to build your own autonomous mobile robot. I'm really excited for this project and it would be even better if you wanted to join in and build it along with me. So if you don't want to miss out on that, make sure you subscribe. Uh, if you want more information about this stuff, you can check out the blog post that's linked in the description below. And if you've got any other questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time.